The year 2008 represents a fundamental break in the entire historical process. The collapse of the entire financial system of the world served as a detonator which in effect destroyed the equilibrium of the entire global capitalist regime. It destroyed at a blow economic equilibrium, political equilibrium, social equilibrium, military and diplomatic equilibrium on a global scale. Now you see this situation, the effects of which we are still living through, is without precedent in history. And there are many unprecedented things. Sudden shocks, changes, crises, which all flow from the basic position. And the reason for this crisis, the depth of the crisis, is very simple, for a Marxist at least. And that can only be understood by, the, by understanding the previous period, the previous 30 years of general capitalist global economic upswing, which ended in this collapse. In effect, the... Uh, world economy, the American economy in particular, we explained this at the time, was defying the laws of gravity. Now there's a limit to how far you can do that. You've seen the cartoons of Bugs Bunny or is it Rhodes Runner? I can't remember. The, uh, this creature runs and runs and runs and runs, runs over the edge of a cliff and he's still running and there's no, nothing underneath him but he, keep, he keeps on running until eventually he looks down, sees the abyss and collapses. Well, something like that occurred to the world financial system in 2008. And what you can say is this, the capitalist system at that time not only reached its limits, it went far beyond its limits, the same as the roadrunner running past the cliff. The capitalist system went far beyond its normal natural limits. Of course, there's nothing particularly new in this, Marx explains in Capital that credit forms, is a, is a natural part, if you like, of capitalism. It's, it exists, it's, it's a necessary part of the capitalism. Yes, but what credit does is it expands the market beyond its natural limits, as you're aware. Credit cards, things like this, mortgages. It extends a purchasing power, therefore expands the market, therefore allows the capitalist system to avoid one of the fundamental contradictions, every 10 minutes don't forget, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is overproduction, at least for a time. The problem, however, is that uh, debts must be repaid. Sooner or later, debts have to be repaid. And at that point, Marx explains this in Capital, in Volume 3, how when the capitalist system re reaches this point, everything turns into its opposite. Whereas previously they were anxious to give credit to expand, not just to individuals, not just to companies, but to whole nations, like Greece, who was given huge debts, which no doubt, those that lent the money knew perfectly well that Greece could never repay those debts. They knew this, but they continued this merry, uh, cheerful process of uh, this merry-go-round of money-making, which reaches a certain point in which everything turns into its opposite. And when that critical point is reached, the whole psychology ch changes. Now it's no longer a question, borrow as much as you like, take out as many, as, as many debts, as many credit cards as you wish. Suddenly it's the opposite. Pay me. Pay me. You can't afford to pay. Sell your furniture, sell your house, sell your wife, sell your kids. But pay me. And that's not just applicable to individuals and companies, but to entire nations, Greece, is a very clear example of this. The Greek people have been squeezed and squeezed and squeezed for the last decade until they, they cannot really be uh, squeezed any further and yet the, the, the capitalists still insist. The Germans in particular, the German capitalists demand payment for, for the, 
for, the, for their excesses of the previous period. Once you understand that, you understand practically all there is to understand pertaining to this question of austerity, which certain blind reformists, the lefts in particular, wrongly ascribe to ideological uh, purposes, as if it was a psychological question. It's the, it's the cause of the meanness, the ignorance, the stupidity, the viciousness, the, the malice of the Tories and, 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 and the, the, the ruling, ruling class. Well, it's true that these people are stupid and malicious, that goes without saying. But that's not the point. Whichever government is in power under these circumstance, circumstances that accepts the capitalist system under these conditions will be compelled to carry out the same policy of cuts and austerity as you saw precisely in Greece. And therefore, you see, we have the following, uh, we have to ask ourselves the following question. Now, for my sins, I regularly read a, a journal called The Economist. I didn't bring the, the latest issue which fell into my hands, dropped onto my carpet uh, uh, of my front door this morning. I read it from, from cover to cover. I wish I hadn't, because uh, you could tell by the cover what was inside. They, they, they now talk about an economic recovery. Everything is marvelous, everything is hum hunky-dory. On the picture of the magazine, they got colored balloons going up. I think the balloons are the illusions of the economists in the, in, the, in the real state of affairs. But let's put it this way, eight years, no, it's not eight, it's nine years already. How time passes when you're enjoying yourself. It's been nine years, almost a decade since this crisis, okay? And if you ask yourself seriously, what has been resolved, really speaking, what's been resolved? The answer is nothing has been resolved. What's been resolved in Greece? Ask the Greeks. What's been resolved in Italy? We will deal with that in a moment. What's been resolved in France? What's been resolved if it comes to that in Britain? The answer is that nothing has been resolved. Nothing serious has been resolved. And as a matter of fact, despite all the euphoria and the stock exchange, which doesn't really, you know, it isn't really a reflection of the real economy as such. It's precisely a reflection of the psychology of the investors at a certain time, which can be moved by all kinds of irrational things. Irrational exuberance, I think, was the phrase Alan Greenspan uh, used to use. Yes, uh, this stock exchange, of course, in America, they're euphoric, particularly since the victory of Trump. Oh, yes. They, they didn't like the idea of Trump coming to power. Now they're beginning to come round. Their mouths begin to water. Because Mr. Trump, who I'll deal with in a moment, is offering them all kinds of nice things. You know, a vast program of public expen expenditure. Keynesianism, I hear you say. Well, not so. Not so. If it's Keynesianism, it's the most peculiar type of Keynesianism that I've ever seen. Because he, he accompanies this vast program of public expenditure on the infrastructure with a program of, of deep, of huge, massive tax cuts for the rich. I can see poor Keynes would be turning, in, not turning in his grave, he'd be spinning in his grave. I mean, how, do, how do you marry these two ideas? If you have a huge program of, of, of state expenditure, it must be paid for. How do you square that by, by re reducing taxation? It does not make sense. And those two things combined, you will see, will add up to an enormous increase in the, in the state deficit, in the public deficit of the United States which is already huge, and that will have consequences further down the road. But of course, the, the bourgeois, the investors, don't see further down the road. They can't see further than their own nose. They smell profits. Here, we're going to make a lot of money. So the stock exchange is, boozing, is, is booming, probably boozing as well. It's, it's, it's booming. Everybody's happy because of this uh, prospect. Yes, but that does not reflect the real situation. If you look at the facts of the case, you will find that this euphoria, this uh, increase in business confidence, as they call it, has not yet, at least, it has not been reflected in any notable increase in productive investment. That's a fact. And therefore, the entire situation is very fragile. And there are many things that, that can go wrong and will go wrong in my estimate, in the next period with the world economy. Starting with China, which as you know played a colossal role. 
in the previous 30 years or more as one of the principal motor forces of the world economy. The Chinese economy now is slowing. You might think that 6.5%, which is what they just agreed in the Congress of the so-called Communist Party, it's not, neither communist nor a party, but that's another matter. This bureaucratic uh, capitalist club have decided that the target that they've got is 6.5%, although many bourgeois economists question the reliability of the statistics, statistics coming out of China in any case, but let's accept it 6.5% for the sake of argument. 6.5% seems a lot if you compare it to the British economy, which if they get 1.5% one growth, of course they're, they're, they're delighted. But 6.5% for China is a disastrous uh, situation. It's been said for decades, the Chinese themselves have said for decades, that a rate of growth below 8% is not sufficient even to absorb the, the growth in the population and the labor force in China. And unemployment in China is growing, by the way. Although it's not admitted, it's concealed. People going back to the villages where they, they're not registered as, as, as unemployed. But nevertheless, China, the, the, the problems of the Chinese economy, where by the way, in relation to debt, China's debt is, internal debt is colossal. It's due to reach in the course of this year, in the course of 2017, the latest figure I saw is it's due to reach 300% of the gross domestic product, which for a country with China's level of income is, is, is an astronomic figure. It dwarfs anything else you can think of. This huge indebtedness is hanging over, and there are many other contradictions piling up in China, which can produce a severe slump in China, as a matter of fact, at any time. And therefore, that is so all, all these things have got to be taken into consideration. But to go back to my earlier remarks about equilibrium, we said, it's in writing, you can read it, at the time of the crisis of 2008, we said the following. All the attempts of the bourgeois to restore economic equilibrium will serve to destroy the social and political equilibrium. That's what we wrote nearly 10 years ago. And if you look at the present world situation, that prediction has been filled 1000%. That's precisely what you see at the present time. Now the bourgeois, the initial response of the American capitalists and bankers and political strategists, they were quite pleased. Relieved is the word, quite relieved. I remember there were new newspaper articles which appeared uh, eight years ago, in which they themselves were, were, were shaking in their shoes. The bankers were saying, well, we, 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 they're going to hang us for what, for what we've done to their lives, what we've done to the American economy. It never occurred. They, they were, what they were afraid of is a popular insurrection of some form or another in America. They were talking like that eight years ago, repeatedly. And when it never occurred, but incidentally, they were very short-sighted people. The, the bankers and capitalists are very short-sighted people. But not as short-sighted as, as the stupid reformists, both left and right, and the, the uh, 57 variety of sectarian idiots who call themselves Marxists and understand absolutely nothing. Where's the revolution? Where's the revolution? Eight years later, there's no revolution. And they, they breathe a sigh of relief. Of course, they, they didn't understand, and they do not understand, the nature of revolution. Now, it's the anniversary, as you're well aware, of the greatest event in human history, which is the October Revolution of 1917. By the way, we should congratulate the Communists, particularly Comet Hamid, has done a marvelous job with his Twitters. He's rivaling uh, Trump, actually, isn't he? He's, he's almost as good as Donald Trump, but... Uh, a twittering. Uh, but it, it, this marvelous coverage of 1917, blow by blow, day by day, it's a marvelous thing. And it, it's incumbent on all serious Marxists to reread one of the greatest works in our arsenal, Trotsky's History of the Russian Revolution. It's a marvelous book. You read it already, read it again. You read it twice, read it three times. You read it ten times and you still learn enormous lessons, not in relation to 1917, but in relation to today. And Trotsky himself developed 
put forward a marvelously profound expression where he referred, using the language of chemistry, to the molecular process of revolution. The molecular process of socialist revolution. What does it mean? Well, it means it's a very dialectical conception. It means that beneath the surface of apparent stability, everything seemed to be tied up, as was the case in Russia and internationally before 1917. Just imagine in the middle of a war, with all the terrible problems that that entailed, the ruling class, the military, the generals, the reactionaries seemed to be 100% in control of the situation. Yes, the Tsar was 100% in control of the situation until he was 100% he'd lost control of the situation. Within a few days, that occurred. And people are left rubbing their eyes or scratching their heads. How could, how could it happen? Where did, where did this come from? And the answer, I go back to Trotsky's remark. The molecular process of socialist revolution. You know, there was a gradual accumulation of discontent, of unhappiness, of frustration, of questioning. People begin to question things which were never questioned before. That process continues uninterruptedly. Although it doesn't necessarily manifest itself on the surface. In order for that to occur, something else is required. Again, referring to chemistry, a catalyst is required. A focal point is required. And this focal point, one way or another, will eventually make in an, an appearance, sometimes in very su surprising manner, manners. But what we have to understand as Marxists is that this subterraneous process, the molecular process of revolution, exists not just in, in Britain, but in France, in Greece, in Italy, in Spain, in the United States of America, in South Korea, we see the explosive situation suddenly arose. Everywhere you can see the same tendency, the same process, which is rooted in the same objective economic subsoil, if you like to put it that way. This feeling of discontent, this feeling something is wrong, Everything is wrong. You see this reflected very strikingly in a number of things. Just in the last 12 months, 12 months is not a long time in history. It's a very short period. Just take the last 12 months. What occurred in Scotland? A political earthquake. I don't want to, to, to trespass on tomorrow's discussion, but that was a political which nobody expected. We didn't expect it as a matter to, to tell the truth. It was an astonishing state of affairs where the Labour Party which dominated Scotland for generations, suddenly was wiped out. And you have this, uh, the rise of the SNP, which now, by the way, I, th I think it's the biggest, per head of the population, is the biggest political party in the world. Somebody told me the other day, but I don't want to, in to interfere with that discussion, which is, will take place tomorrow. It's an important discussion that we must have. Yes, but then you have the, the, the general election, the, the, f the Corbyn phenomenon. What did this reflect? What did Corbyn represent? He represented precisely that element, that focal point, that once that, and it was an accident if you like, that, re that really was an accident. Some communists tried to, tried to make out that it was all uh, the result of a, a, worked out, a process and so on. No, 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 it was an accident. It really was an accident that, that he, he could even present himself as a candidate. But that, you know, as Hegel explains, necessity expresses itself through an accident. All it took was for this one rather, conf I'll have to say, rather confused left reformist to put in an appearance and hundreds of thousands of people began to get active in politics, join the Labour Party and so on and so forth. Astonishing, incredible, not at all, not at all, entirely predictable from a Marxist point of view. Once you understand that it's an expression of this very process in British society, which is not, which was not reflected in the Labour Party in the slightest degree. That's just nonsense to maintain such a thing. There's no, absolutely no reflection whatsoever. And the Parliamentary Labour Party still does not reflect in any degree the real situation in British society. It's an irony. These reformists, these peacocks, these ignoramuses, 
Imagine that they're great intelligent intellectuals and so on that understand things that ordinary mortals cannot understand. Not so, it's the other way around. The ordinary man or woman in the street and in the factories and in the schools and in the universities understand and feel far more what is really happening in this country than these clowns sitting in their cocoons in the Westminster hothouse. But again, that's trespassing on tomorrow's discussion. What I'm dealing with is the process. Brexit, the result of the referendum. What's that? Another earthquake. Earthquake after earthquake. Unexpected. Nobody expected this. All the pundits were left gasping. And what does it re reflect? Fundamentally, it reflects the same feeling of alienation, of discontent, I would say of hate, of distrust, of course. I would say more than that, a hatred and a loathing of the ruling class and its political representatives, not just the Tories, but the Labour also. The Labour right wing also are seen in just the same way, and, and justifiably so, because they, they also represent the ruling class. But you see, Brexit was an, uh, an explosive development, which really upset the apple cart, not just, uh, not just in Britain, but in Europe, accelerating all the centrifugal tendencies, by the way, I wrote a document, I think, in 1992, Fred will correct me if I'm mistaken, called a socialist alternative to the European Union. Yuri, I think we, I think we should republish that. I will not, I wouldn't have to change a single dot or comma of what was written at that time. You predicted exactly what was going to happen. Also with the Euro. Ted explained that. He explained, that, he explained that it's impossible to unite countries which are moving in a different direction. You see the, the effects in Europe. I'll come back to Europe in a moment. But first of all, we have to deal with events over the other side of the pond. Now that is an interesting development. That's a very interesting development. Donald J. Trump, where does he fit into, into all, all this? Well, he fits rather nicely as a matter of fact. What you have seen in America, by the way, the election of Trump, I mean, the Brexit was uh, a bombshell, an earthquake, you use any uh, metaphor that you wish, or any simile that you wish. But in relation to uh, the election of Trump, that was the biggest earthquake of all. And it was something that was not only not expected, it was not expected by Trump himself. You know, the, 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 when the election results were, you know, Trump is rather a, not the most modest individual I could think of, you know. And uh, he, he would have had a street party organized, be sure of it. No, 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 he only invited a handful of people because he expected to lose. How could he not lose? With all the powers that be opposed to him. With all the media. That's one of the arguments they use against us, isn't it? Against the possibility of revolution. Oh, you can't have a revolution. What about the media? You don't control the media. They, can, they, they decide everything. Well, no, my friends, they don't. Apparently. The media didn't decide uh, the result of the Brexit referendum in Britain. They didn't decide what happened in Scotland. And they certainly didn't decide what happened in the United States. Where, astonishingly, I believe it's true to say, only one newspaper, and I think that was a regional paper, supported Trump. Every single other media outlet, not just the newspapers, the magazines, the radio and the television were, were violently opposed to Trump. Even Fox News. I can't get my head around that. How is it possible? Donald Trump is an expert at offending people, but how could he, how could he offend Fox News? This is a, a mystery. Ultra right wing. No, no, they were all viciously howling and baying and attacking him and uh, resorting to all kinds of tricks. Yes, and in spite of that, he still won. He won against the whole of the establishment, not just the, Demo not just the Democrat Party establishment, but the establishment of his own party, the Republican Party. By the way, that's the difference with Bernie Sanders, unfortunately. And one of the lessons that we have to learn here is the limitations of reformism, of all brands of reformism. You know, Trotsky once said, betrayal is inherent in reformism. Remember that? Betrayal is inherent in all forms of reformism. I'd, I'd go a bit further than that. I'd say especially left reformism. 
That does not mean, by the way, is the sex. The sex are always ranting and raving and insulting people, attacking people. We don't do this. We don't attack uh, the reformists in that, in that way. We criticize their policies, we explain their limitations, and we pose an alternative in a positive manner. That's, that's our method. Nevertheless, it remains true, and we, we better get our heads around this. Betrayal is inherent in reformism. It does not mean that the reformists deliberately betray. You think that uh, Tsipras and Varoufakis in Greece deliberately set, set out to, to do what they did? I'm telling you that they did not. They stood in an anti-austerity program which they hoped, they, they believed they could carry out. They believed on the basis of friendly negotiation, compromise, you know, we give a little, they give a little. The typical mentality of the reformists. With Merkel, it's like the lamb trying to arrive at, arrive at an amicable agreement with a lion or a hungry wolf that hasn't had his dinner. Yes, they made mincemeat of them. And, so, and they were forced to do the opposite of what they said that they would do. And that's a law, an absolute law. That's why we cannot have under any circumstances any illusions in reformists, no matter how left-wing they might be. We will support them against the right-wing that goes without saying. We, report, we, we, we supported, of course, uh, Syriza against the right-wing in Greece, of course. We wanted Syriza to be elected, naturally. A apart from anything else, to put the reformists to the test. In Britain, we would support Corbyn, naturally against the, the right wing. Trouble is, he isn't supporting himself against the right wing. That's the, uh, that's the big difficulty. And that, that, again, is typical of the conduct of a reformist. But to go back to, to America, you see, everyone talks about Trump. Not many people nowadays talk about the other side of the coin, which is Bernie Sanders. Look, at the beginning of the ele electoral campaign, in, in America, about what, two years ago? Nobody had heard of Bernie Sanders, practically, except a small group of political uh, pundits or activists. But nobody knew who this man was. <coughs> Everybody had heard of Hillary Clinton. And nobody would have given the slightest possibility of Bernie Sanders getting anywhere in this internal uh, contest with, with Hillary Cl Clinton. And yet, and yet, no sooner that did he begin to speak, and by the way, he spoke in quite radical language, uh, <coughs> he talked about the need, he, he denounced Wall Street corruption, he denounced Hillary Clinton for being in the pockets of Wall Street, which is absolutely correct, being financed by Wall Street, which is absolutely true. And uh, he actually called repeatedly for a political revolution against the billionaire class. Now that's fighting talk. When have you heard anything like that pronounced by any member of the Labour Party, including J Jeremy Corbyn? I wish somebody in Britain would call for a political revolution against the billionaire class, then they, then they really would get some support. Sanders, Sanders did this and immediately, as if from nowhere, there were mass meetings, mainly of young people, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, participated in, there were two, I remember two demonstrations in Texas, not demonstrations, rallies, I mean, rallies, of uh, over 10,000 people in each of those meetings, and they were enthusiastic meetings, rare into, a movement came as if from nowhere. It raised a lot of money, it raised millions, so much so that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, what Sanders could honestly say, look, I don't need the money from big business, I'm financed by my supporters, which is what a political movement uh, should be like. And the fact of the matter is, Sanders was on the point of defeating uh, Hillary Clinton, but he was defeated by the, the machinations of the, this bourgeois party, the, the Democrat party, which uh, pulled all the tricks to get rid of him. It's, it was revealed by WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks. Now they're making a big hoo-ha, big fuss. Oh, it's the Russians. The Russians leaked this. Well, they may have leaked it, they may not have leaked it. Who knows? It's possible. But as the, as the representative of WikiLeaks pointed out, he says, look, I don't ask, when something arrives at my desk, I don't ask what the source is. I ask myself two questions. Is the information here correct? And is it in the public, public interest to publish? In this case, the answer to both questions was yes. And the truth is, it was accepted by all the other newspapers, the Washington Post, they all published this information. And uh, it, it resulted in people being... Uh, 
kicked out of the uh, positions in the Democrat. But in other words, it was true. This information was true. Now the, the, there's a huge smoke screen. Now what's the Russians? Is the Russians uh, Putin? Now, I'm not a friend of Putin's, but it seems he's responsible for everything. You know, <laughs> even if it, uh, even these snowstorms in the states, it's probably a Russian plot. I don't know. Cooked up in the meteorological department of es espionage of the uh, of the SSB or whatever they call themselves, KGB. You know, this, but this, this vast campaign against Trump, but Trump stood up against this campaign. He's quite an amusing guy. You know, I, I had to say to John, John Peterson the others, look, John, I've got a terrible confession to make. I always found American politics exceedingly boring. That was a part of the economist I, I tended to skip, skip over, you know. But now it suddenly became interesting. Thanks to Donald Trump, uh, Donald Trump to a certain extent. But see, Trump actually went to the, uh, uh, when they were, they were gunning for him, they were gunning for him, at least he had the courage of his convictions to turn up at the Republican convention and say, yes, will I support uh, the, any candidate that's, uh, that's uh, supported by my party, the, the Republican party? Yes, I'll support any, any candidate as long as it's me. <laughs> and he meant it. That's what Sanders should have done in the Democrats, but he didn't. He backed down. That's the truth of the matter. In the name of unity, this terrible disease, this obsession with unity, which afflicts the Labour Party and afflicts, I'm sorry to say, Jeremy Corbyn and uh, John MacDonald, that they terrified of a split, terrified of a split from the right wing. So, the capitalist class exercised their influence through the Labour right wing. So that's that's u unity. And the left reformists cling to the right wing. That means that the Labour Party remains under the control of, of capital. And Bernie Sanders acted in the same way, therefore completely demoralizing and disappointing and disorienting his followers. Now, he may, he may come back. If, if it's not him, it'll be someone else. But the important point for us is not that. This has got a colossal symptomatic importance. Incidentally, let me, let me make one thing clear to you. Perhaps it's not so clear. Many, if not most, well, I'll say many, of Trump voters would have voted equally for, for Sanders. And they've said so. And vice versa. Because they seem to be candidates offering a change, and they seem to be somehow standing up to big business. Although, how the hell Donald Trump, being a billionaire, could stand up to big business is a mystery. But, no, but he did demagogically put forward this, this thing. The word working class was never used in American elections. It was middle class, middle class. It was Trump that started to raise. No, it's the workers, the American workers have had a raw deal, too many unemployed, they've shut the coal mines and so on. This struck a chord. Same as the Brexit campaign struck a chord in the unemployed people in the Northeast, in Wales and so on. You can't blame them for that. That's quite, uh, quite clear. But the most important thing is this. Sanders put the, and Trump between them put the cat out of the bag and there was a, there was a poll con conducted right at the beginning of the campaign before before Sanders campaign had really took off which said I think I'm correct in saying Rob will correct me 67 percent of young Americans under the age of uh, 25 said that they would vote for a, 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 they'd be prepared to vote for a socialist president and the same paper said, oh, don't worry, don't worry, it's not so, not so bad as that, because those over 65 years of age, only 35% of them would vote for a, for a socialist president. I mean, that's astounding. 35% of, of Americans over 65 years of age, do you know what that means? After decades and decades of attacks against socialism and all its works, socialism is the same as communism, is the same as totalitarianism, so on. 65 people, 35% of people above 65 years would have been prepared to vote for, for Bernie Sanders, in other words. This is in, in, indicative of a profound change, or at least, let me choose my words carefully, of the beginnings of, of a profound change in the whole psychology of the United States. Now, Trump won the election, despite all the odds. And the ruling class, of course, the ruling class of all countries have got ways and means of controlling maverick candidates, candidates that don't suit them. They've got ways, a thousand ways of doing this. And they were, they were fairly sure, they weren't quite sure, but they were fairly sure that Trump, once he was elected, 
He would change his tune, he would calm down, he would be reasonable, he'd be moderate, he'd follow advice and so on. It didn't happen, did it? It didn't happen. Therefore, there is also other means. For example, and this is absolutely without precedent, the entire in intelligence services of the U.S. here, 12 different agencies, agencies gangs up on the, gang up on the president. Can you imagine it? And uh, I suppose another person would have backed down immediately, not Trump. He took them on. Now, what does this mean? This is an open split in the state at the very top level. That's a very serious state of affairs. One thing, they, they cannot forgive uh, Donald Trump because he's exposing for his own ends, he's exposing the, uh, the rottenness and the uh, deceit and the lies of the system, including he's now taking on the F FBI also. He's a class with the, this is in An American, American president cla oh, publicly clashing with the FBI. A split in the state in the most fundamental institutions. By the way, the secret services, in case you didn't know, are supposed to be secret. <laughs> you know, not, the, not supposed to be paraded in public in the way that uh, that, uh, that has occurred. The, the, these, are, these cracks are indicative of, a, of a, not just a political crisis in the States, but a crisis of the regime. And therefore, my friends, watch this space. Watch this space. It's true that Trump can last. You won't be easily removed, as some people imagine. That, that ain't going to happen. Apart from that, he's still got a lot of support. Because people say, well, look, he's doing what he, what he said, which is true. And therefore, what you can say is this. I don't want to be misinterpreted on this. Donald J. Trump, of course, is an ultra-reactionary. A billionaire who represents the interests of capital. Extreme right-winger. His program is reactionary. Yes, but in a distorted reactionary way, even Trump reflects the discontent, the, the, the hatred, the anger that is built up within American society. Against what? Against the status quo. Some comments know that I, I particularly am fond of an American writer. I consider him to be the greatest of all. I would have said living writers, but he died a few, a few years ago. Gore Vidal, wonderful writer, and he wrote the following in one of his essays. He said, our republic has one party the property party with two right wings, the Republicans and, the Republic, Republicans and Democrats. That's correct, by the way. That's correct. And for 100 years, the, stability of, the political stability of America was determined by this uh, constant game. Uh, Republicans, Democrats, Democrats, nothing changes, everything the same. Not anymore. It's been blown sky high. That's, that's what they can't uh, forgive him. What you're seeing before your very eyes, and not just, in, not just in America, is the collapse of the center. The collapse of the political center, and that's dangerous from the standpoint of capitalism. The collapse of the center means the entry of extremism, by which they mean an increasing sharp polarization to the left, yes, and to the right. Sharp polarization to the left and to the right. And the old comfortable setup of liberalism, so it's been destroyed. And I'll go so far as to say, it's a da damn good thing that it's destroyed. It reflects the past, it doesn't reflect the present situation. The present situation of capitalism demands sharp attacks against the working class, cuts and austerity, also in America, yes, it's true. Uh, Trump just abolished uh, Obamacare, which wasn't uh, much of a reform. But as a result of that, I think 23 million Americans no longer have any uh, co coverage for, for, for health. This is a serious state of affairs. And one other thing, I've only been dealing with one side of the picture here. The most important thing for us is the other side of the coin. It is again without precedent that no sooner that an, that an American president has been installed in the White House, millions of people come onto the streets. Mass demonstrations which nobody called, nobody organized, spontaneous demonstrations. With this huge demonstration of the women. But that's just one demonstration, there were many others. Spontaneous demonstrations. Very radical demonstrations. Our American comrades are intervening energetically. And therefore I say to you, watch this space. America is going to surprise the whole world. Everyone thinks that America is a very conservative, which it was, which it was, it still is to some extent. But that, that can change into its opposite. 
to quote the Bible, which you know I'm particularly fond of. For the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. What's this space? Now, of course, for, from our point of view, I won't say much about economics, which we have discussed at length for, for quite a long time. Suffice to say that the, uh, the world, the so-called recovery, uh, insofar as it exists, to some extent, it, it does exist in the States to some extent, not as much as they claim. But it's the weakest economic recovery in history. That's, that's a plain fact. And it's very fragile. It's threatened by all kinds of things, including by jo Donald J. Trump. Now, Trump's program is simple. I would say childishly simple. It's summed up in a, a well-known slogan. America first. America first. Make America great again, he says. And he means it. And what he means by that is make America great at the expense of the rest of the world. You know, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. May is going to have a bit of a surprise. You know, they, 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 a number of surprises, unpleasant, all of them unpleasant. This negotiations with uh, Europe, the Brexit negotiations, the fun is going to start now, ladies and gentlemen. The fun is going to start the moment she sits down. They really, they didn't make any plans, these guys. They didn't plan anything. Trotsky said that the British ruling class thought not in years, not in decades, but in centuries. Yes, that was then, not anymore. Now they can't think from one moment to the next. Sorry, old chap. <laughs> nothing, against this, nothing against this chairman, by the way. Friend of mine, Welsh, you know. <laughs> but this, the moment that the negotiations, you'll see. If, if, if Theresa May imagines that she's going to get, get a, a, a reasonable deal from the European bourgeois, she's got another thing coming. First of all, even if they wanted to give her a decent deal, which many of them do not because they, they're annoyed at the whole business of Brexit, more than annoyed, furious. And therefore, some of them want to get their own back on the, this government in London. But even if they wanted to give concessions, they cannot do so. It's materially impossible. Because if they give Britain a decent deal, then other countries will be encouraged to follow the same route. And there's plenty of anti-EU anti feeling in, in Europe at the present time. And therefore, they're gonna, the British government is going to get, a, the British ruling class is going to get one hell of a shock. They're going to get a kick up the ass from uh, Merkel and uh, and company, you see, just watch, watch, watch what happens. Oh yes, no, but it doesn't matter because we, we're open to the rest of the world. Like America. What a pleasant re reception uh, May got from, uh, from Trump. Yeah, Trump likes uh, Britain. He keeps on saying he likes, he likes our golf courses and so on and so forth. Happened to be in Scotland, but that's another matter. I was quite amused. One of the local Scottish newspapers, I think in Aberdeen, carried us as a headline after Trump won the election. Uh, local, uh, local Aberdeen businessman, uh, no, owner of a local go go Scottish go golf course, wins the American election. <laughs> this is nationalism gone mad, isn't it? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, so they, they, they won't get a, de a decent, she won't get a decent deal of Trump. Trump's policy is America first. Britain sells more goods to America than what they receive. Trump's not going to accept that. He'll impose quite harsh terms. Oh, then there's India. She went to India to speak to Modi. And Modi says, yes, of course. You can have a deal with you once you complete your negotiations with Europe, whenever that might be. Yes, but as a condition, you understand, you must accept a lot more immigrants from India. And students. And other uh, visitors, which of course uh, is impossible. That the, defeats the whole purpose of, of uh, the Brexiteers' uh, strategy. In other words, they're in a mess. But this whole Brexit business has enormously accelerated all the centrifugal tendencies in Europe, the tendency to break up, which, which we predicted, which we predicted uh, more than two decades ago. Now, you see the position in Greece, which I've mentioned. I won't spend much time on Greece. We've dealt with that at length. Nothing's been resolved in Greece, and yet they, they're squeezing and forcing and pushing Tsipras, the reformist, to carry out further... Uh, vicious deep cuts. There are demonstrations, there are protests, therefore that has not been uh, resolved. The euro itself has not been resolved. The euro is still, there's still quite a few people prepared to bet 
on the stock exchanges against the euro, the Europe. And of course, now, we always stated that, well, not always, in the document I wrote in 1992, it wasn't Greece that I referred to as the weak link, but Italy. The reason is very simple, Greece was not a member at that time when I wrote that uh, document. But Italy is now, in my opinion, the, the weakest link in the chain of European capitalism. People don't talk much about Italy, but Italy is in a dire economic uh, crisis. Italy's accumulated debt amounts to 130% of the GDP. That's completely un 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 intolerable. It's not feasible. And there's a massive crisis of the Italian banks. The oldest bank in the world, what's it, the Monte di Paschi? Di Siena. Di Siena. That's right, that's right. Thank you, uh, Francesco, my friend. It's, uh, it's bankrupt. It's the oldest bank in the world that is bankrupt. And the entire Italian banking system, if the truth were to be called, is bankrupt. And we can only survive, uh, a banking collapse in Italy, which would be a disaster, can only be a, 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 a solved, averted, by a massive injection of public money, of uh, government funds. Problem, this is not allowed by the, e by the European Union, which states in a legislation passed about 12 months ago, I think, that any bank that receives government funds must be de declared bankrupt. In other words, they want to put the bill, for, they want to force the, the, the small guys, small investors, small the people with, with money in the banks, to pay the bill. But in, in Italy, many of these people, there are many lower class people, workers even, but particularly small shopkeepers and so on, that, keep the, that, that invest in the banks. Therefore, they could have a situation similar to that faced by Argentina a decade ago. Or was it two decades ago? No, it was a decade, decade ago. When the banks collapsed and the president of Argentina had to flee from insurrectionary uh, rioters, in effect, in a helicopter from the roof of the presidential, presidential palace. So therefore, Italy is in a very serious situation. Rienzi, who was the leader of the Democratic Party, the ex that came out of the old Communist Party, the old Communist Party doesn't exist anymore. It's a bourgeois party, held a referendum. When was it, in November? December, December yes, as recently as that held a referendum giving him extra powers. Powers to carry out further attacks on, on the working class, to carry through reforms, of, co of course. And to his, uh, again, uh, in another political earthquake, he suffered a shattering defeat by 20%, a margin of 20%. He was completely rejected. That referendum was a vote of no confidence by the Italian people against the entire political uh, establishment all the parties, starting with the Democrat Party. Which indicates what? It indicates the same process, I would say the same revolutionary process taking place in Italy that, I dis that I've discussed in relation to other, uh, other parts of the world. There's this movement, this, there should be elections, I don't know, I think they're trying to delay the elections. But if there were elections tomorrow, it's probable there's, there's this new party, the uh, Five Star Movement, I think it's called, led by, led by a comedian, perhaps appropriately, mm. called uh, Beppe, Beppe Grillo. Is it Grillo or Grillo? Grillo. Grillo, yeah. The main pr platform of this party is against, against the Euro, actually, not so much against the EU, but against the Euro. <coughs> actually, they have a point, they do have a point. It's not true that the Euro caused the crisis in Italy. But it is true that in the past, the Italian bourgeois would have got out of this situation by devaluing, devaluing the lira, giving themselves a competitive advantage. They can't do that now. They've got the euro. There is no, 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 lira, no, no lira. Therefore, if you could imagine the victory of an anti-euro party in Italy, the effect, that, the, the effect that that would have would be a catastrophic political effect, effect all over Europe. Where well, there is, as I, as I say, a, an increasing mood developing, an angry mood, and an opposition to the European Union. Which, of course, wouldn't solve anything if, if they were to, uh, to leave. But nevertheless, it, what it does mean 
is that the crisis of Europe has now reached an absolutely critical uh, point. It's, uh, somebody said the other day at the centre that uh, nowadays no government in Europe has got the same position. They're all at loggerheads. The Eastern Europeans, for example, are uh, against uh, Merkel's policy in relation to the refugees. The refugee issue has caused a crisis in Europe such that the Schengen, Schengen Agreement, really speaking, is now a bit of a fiction. This idea of free movement. Well, they've, they've introduced controls in many parts of Europe. And therefore, if you think about it, the two fundamental uh, elements holding the thing together, holding together the European Union, was the euro on the one hand, which is in doubt whether it can survive or not, and secondly, the Schengen Agreement, which is, really speaking, it's, it's in ruins. And therefore, the entire crisis in Europe is coming rapidly to a head. Now, to change the, the, the uh, to shift the emphasis slightly, there's also a crisis in relation to world relations. The relationship of forces has changed. In the, how, much, how much time have we got? You've got 50 minutes. How much have we got left? 10. Oh, I thought I was afraid of that. <laughs> uh, the situation has changed. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, there really speaking was only one superpower in the world, and that was America, American imperialism, which has got a crushing military and financial and uh, economic uh, su superiority still, despite everything. Yes, that's true. But you see the limits of American power, you can see that in the Middle East. Under uh, President Bush, George W. Bush, I think he's seen too many cowboy films, you know, too many John Wayne films, the Seventh Cavalry. So he invaded I Iraq to remove uh, Saddam Hussein. And after that, he stood on the, on the, on the, on the deck of a, an aircraft carrier, dressed in military fatigues, which is a bit ironical since he avoided the draft during the Vietnam War, but uh, leave that to one side. And he made the, the, the following statement, mission accomplished. Well, well, over a decade later, look at the situation in the, not just in Iraq, but in the whole region. What has been accomplished? And the fact of the matter is, American imperialism has been defeated. That's the, the fact of the matter. They had to withdraw from Iraq. And in Syria, see, that's the other side of the coin. In Syria, they've clashed with Russia. Assad, the uh, Syrian uh, dictator, if you like, was an, and is a Russian agent, a Russian uh, puppet, if you like, a supporter of Russia. And Russia cannot accept the loss of uh, Syria to the jihadi madmen and the Saudis and the Turks. They weren't prepared to accept that. And the American imperialists, they weren't prepared to accept that. The same as they weren't prepared to accept the loss of the Ukraine. And the West, what did the West do? What did America do? The most powerful nation on earth. They made a lot of noise. Every day you see what's the television, it becomes a bit monotonous after a while, you know. Attacking the Russians, the terrible Russians, this, that and the other. Protests, howls of rage. Yes, I add howls of impotent rage, <coughs> you know. As Shakespeare, you wrote a play, much ado about nothing. A lot of noise. What action was taken? None whatsoever. They sent a few troops to Poland. So what? Poland is a long way from, uh, from Syria. And in reality, the Russians in Syria outmaneuvered the Americans at every single step. The fall of Aleppo was a decisive turn in the situation. Incidentally, let's be clear about this. It's true that Assad is a monster, it's true that his uh, regime is, is a terrible dictatorship which, which we can't support. But on the other hand, this business of a moderate opposition is a straight lie. There is no such thing as a moderate democratic opposition in Syria. They're all jihadi monsters of one description or another. Not just ISIS, but other, the other crowd, Al-Nusra and other gangsters which the Americans were supporting, and the Saudis were supporting, and the Turks were supporting, up until recently, up until recently. 
And therefore, as far as we're concerned, it's a struggle between, of, of crocodiles against snakes. That's about the, the long and short of it. The Russians stepped in. They didn't want to lose their, uh, to the, their support that they had, the base they've got in, in, in Syria. And that decisively changed the equation. They then uh, surprised the Americans recently by doing a deal with Turkey. That's a surprise. Erdogan was also a monster, a complete reactionary monster with big ideas. Turkey, he's got imperial ambitions. Believe it or not, his ambition is to recreate the Ottoman Empire, if you can believe that, take control. Of course, this, this uh, dream of his bears no relation at all to the reality of the situation. But the real situation is that Russia now controls. They persuaded Erdogan that it was in his interests to do a deal with them rather than with the Americans, which he accepted. And therefore, they did a deal. The deal consisted of the following. Turkey would drop its support for the rebels in Aleppo, which finished them. And the Russians, with equal cynicism, would drop their support for the Kurds. Erdogan's main concern at this moment in time is to crush the Kurds, which he's doing in the most brutal and bloodthirsty manner imaginable. There's about half a million people who have been <coughs> displaced. He's doing that, by the way, in order to draw people's attention away from the problems in Turkey, which provoked, don't forget this, it provoked a popular uprising in Turkey a couple of years, a few years ago, two or three years ago, I can't remember where it was. It was in order to draw attention away from that, that he tried to play the national card of whipping up this uh, horrible Turkish nationalism directed against the unfortunate Kurds. So here you have all, all kinds of contradictions. In the battle for Aleppo, you've got the American Air Force in the bombing from the air, and the main fighting force on the ground are the Kurds, fighting quite courageously against these monsters, this uh, the ISIS uh, gang, in, 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 around Mosul. Mosul, they thought they were going to take it by Christmas. They didn't say what year. As I pointed out at the time, they, I said they weren't going to take it as easily as that. It would take some time. Yes, but they will take it eventually. It will fall eventually. I think the, the jihadis really on the, on, are on the point of being defeated there for different reasons. The Turks have withdrawn their support. Yes, but the question arises now, when Mosul falls, who takes over? Now that's an interesting point. You may or may not know this, but the Turks have always considered two Kurdish uh, cities, Mosul and Kirkuk, as part of Turkey. A few months ago they published a map with Mosul and Kirkuk shown as part of, of Turkey. So again, watch this space. The, the, the vultures are circling, and I'm afraid that the poor Kurds once again will find out the truth of the old adage, nations do not have friends, only interests. Very true statement. The imperialists have always regarded uh, the national question, small nations, a small change, small change <coughs> in their pockets to, to, to be negotiated uh, away. And therefore, that, uh, that, that question remains to be solved. Saudi Arabia. Again, a monstrous regime. Oh, our friend, of course, they, they don't talk about the atrocities committed by Saudi Arabia and their agents. Saudi Arabia is our friend. Send a lot of, we sell a lot of weapons to them, as you well know. Saudi Arabia is engaged in a genocidal war against the Houthi rebels in Yemen. Now these wretched hypocrites it's disgusting the level of hypocrisy in the propaganda. Channel 4 News is particularly guilty of this. Oh, the terrible starvation, is the starvation in Africa, oh, and the Yemen, oh, and the Yemen. The Saudis are using and have used, with British full support and connivance, and American support and connivance, they've used the weapon of mass starvation in the Yemen, which is far more serious than the scenes you've seen in the Sudan, which has been on. Oh, don't talk about that. Saudi Arabia is our friend, and so on and so forth. It's really monstrous what they're doing. Yes, but the Saudis have been defeated in, in the Yemen. That monstrous reactionary Saudi regime has been sucked into a war which they cannot win. The rebels, the Houthi rebels, are content with the support of Iran. 
are continuing to fight and there's no way that they can win that war. And therefore even Saudi Arabia now, which was quite a stable bastion of reaction, it's not stable anymore. You may not know this, Saudi Arabia for the first time in history has got a, a big budget deficit. They can't afford to pay the subsidies which they use to buy the loyalty of uh, the Saudi populace. That's finished. They're engaged in cuts. They just reduced the supplies of oil to Egypt and Sisi now has turned to Russia and Iran and Syria uh, instead. In other words, the whole balance of forces has shifted. The Middle East, of course, is in a, a, a state of crisis. That in turn, that in turn has led to this stampede of refugees. Millions of unfortunate, poor, starving, shell-shocked people, men, women and children, desperately trying to get into Europe. And of course the politicians are very sorry for these people, aren't they? They always talk about the fate of the poor refugees, the monstrous regime of Assad and so on. Yes, but when these poor people actually come asking for asylum and knocking on the door, they are met with barbed wire, razor wire, tear gas, stun grenades, even bullets. Okay? And it isn't just the Hungarians that are... The Hungarians are, are the front men. They're being silently supported, of course, by Merkel and the rest of the European Union. That's the meaning of humanitarianism from a capitalist point of view. Now, I've been asked to sum up and I haven't even started. <laughs> the world is quite a big place, you know. But what I've said I think perhaps is sufficient to show one or two things. First of all, the capitalist system is in an organic, systemic, global crisis from which they cannot extricate themselves. They're doing what they can. They can't find any way out of this. Secondly, the effects of this crisis is beginning or has begun, let's not talk about future tense, has begun to penetrate the minds of millions of people, not just in Britain, but throughout the world, throughout Europe, throughout the world, I would say. Of course, there's the beginnings of a movement there is, there is undoubtedly the beginnings of a movement, a protest movement. It takes different forms. I've no doubt whatsoever that there'll be the elections in France, I think they do in April now. It is possible that Marine Le Pen will win those elections. And I've no doubt whatsoever that the cry will be raised immediately about fascism in France and reaction. Well, no such thing complete arrant nonsense, a complete misunderstanding, a complete distortion of the facts. What are the facts? First of all, President Hollande, socialist reformist president, in the last elections won a landslide victory in France. A landslide victory, not just as a president, not just the, the, the socialist party didn't just win the presidential elections, they won all the local elections, and the parliamentary elections, on an anti-austerity program, like in Greece. So what did Orlan do? He comes to power and does precisely the opposite. Carries out a program of cuts and austerity. Naturally, I repeat, if you accept the capitalist system and the present conditions, you will be forced, whether you like it or not, to carry out a policy of cuts and austerity. That, of course, has an effect. People are disgusted, people are alienated, and prepares the way for the uh, movement of the right, which follows as night follows day. Who's responsible if, if Le Pen wins? Who's I'll tell you who's responsible. Francois Hollande is responsible. The so-called Socialist Party is responsible. They're preparing the, the, the way as night follows day for the victory of, 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 the, of the right. Incidentally, Marine Le Pen, let's be clear about this, Marine Le Pen is not a fascist, her father was. She's broken with that. She's a, a, a normal common or garden, right-wing conservative reactionary, that's all. Uses a lot of demagogy, known as populism, I don't like that word, but still. Let me go a bit further. Who's responsible for Donald Trump's victory? I'll tell you. Obama's responsible for that. Eight years ago, when Obama stood, he said, I stand for a change. And American electors, who people didn't used to vote in, in elections in the States, were queuing up to vote for Obama. 
Eight years later, people ask, look at, look, look at their living standards, look at their wages, look at their condition. They say, change? What change? There is no change. Now, Trump is also offering them a change. There'll be no change under Trump either. But let's put it this way. Every, everywhere you look, the masses are seeking a way out of the crisis, and therefore, there'll be, we, you can predict in advance, there'll be huge swings on the electoral front to the left and to the right. Okay? Different political parties and governments and leaders and programs will be put to the test and will be discarded one after the other until such time as the workers and youth begin to understand that what is necessary here is neither more nor less than, in a way, what Bernie Sanders was saying. A political revolution against the billionaire class, a fundamental change in society, a revolution. And by the way, that word in the past, if you put that forward in the, in the States, particularly, or in Britain, people would look at you as if you were not quite right uh, in the head. I say to you, no more. No more. People now are open. I've been in this movement for many years. I've seen all kinds of situations. I've never seen a situation where people were more open to the ideas of Marxism and revolution than ever before in the past. And therefore, it's our task. It should be relatively easy. It's never completely easy. You want an easy life, you come to the wrong place. Life is hard. Our task is hard. It's not easy. Yes, but nevertheless, if you try, if you approach people with these ideas, now you will get a hearing. People will not dismiss the, these ideas. If they're expressed correctly, cogently, in language that people can understand, I believe that the audience for revolutionary Marxism has never been greater than what it is at the present time. And therefore, comrades, comrades, chairman and friends, it's up to us, it's up to you, every single one of you, to make sure that these ideas are transmitted urgently, accurately, passionately to the workers, beginning with the advanced workers, the youth in particular, organizing what is required, the factor which is missing, the factor which is missing ev ev everywhere, the subjective factor, which is a revolutionary organization, a revolutionary tendency, which can form the base as things develop in the future for a mass revolutionary party in Britain, in Europe, and throughout the world.